Well, turn in your Bibles or your phone, your tablet, whatever you have this morning to John's first letter, chapter 5. We've been studying through this letter, and we're almost at the end of it here. We're in the final chapter of 1 John, chapter 5. And so John has covered a lot. He's talked about what it means to be a follower of Christ, to know true doctrine or belief about Christianity, and what it means to follow the law of God. And he's talked about what it means to love others. We call that the social test of what it means to be a follower of Christ. And so this morning we'll read verses 1 through 5 of 1 John chapter 5. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that your Holy Spirit would bring about faith in our hearts this morning. That you would use your word to strengthen us, to equip us, and that we would respond in faith this morning to your word. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. It's a beautiful morning this morning. It is obviously springtime in the low country. And that means a couple things. That means we have a lot of tourists coming in uh, from all over the world, all over the country, um, even Marvin, North Carolina. People come as far as Marvin, North Carolina to visit the low country, do the, the tours and, and the restaurants and all that kind of stuff. It also means the bridge race, right? That's kind of the kickoff to the spring tourist season is the bridge race. So last Saturday, Edward and I ventured out and ran the bridge race. Um, we both did pretty well. Uh, we didn't catch up with, with the Kenyans who ran it, I think, in like 29 minutes. We were still probably warming up at that point. Uh, maybe next year we'll train harder and um, get it closer to 29 minutes, which is a ridiculous time, to be honest with you. Uh, but it was a great event. They had, I think they had 35,000 runners and walkers this year. And, you, you know, you start in Mount Pleasant, uh, Moultrie Mill, and you run, and, and you run over the Sham Creek Bridge, which until you run it, you don't realize how steep it is. Uh, when you run over the Shem Creek Bridge, and then you go over the Ravenel, which is horrible, and then you have a couple more miles to go after that, and you really hate running while you're doing it. And then you finish at Marion Square, and there's tons of people there, and uh, it, was, it was a great event, great event. The weather was great. They were calling for rain, and I think it started sprinkling a little bit at the beginning, but it was, it was actually kind of nice and warm and perfect weather. And so before the race starts, it's kind of fun. You're kind of hanging out. There's a ton of people there. There's a lot of energy. People are ready to run their race. There's runners. There's walkers. They're playing music. It, there's a lot of energy. It's kind of fun. It's fun after the race because you get into Marion Square, and they've got food. They've got drinks. So you can get water. You've got bagels. You've got 18-wheelers full of, like, bananas and apples. You can get donuts, Domino's Pizza. They just hand out stuff. And so you can get a lot of food, and everyone's excited because you're done. You've run the race. Jim and Nick's had barbecue sliders you could get. Those were fantastic. Um, so it's fun after the race. But during the race, and especially near the end of the race, it's not that much fun. It's not that enjoyable. You're tired. You're fatigued. You realize you're not in that great of shape. People pass you that are a lot older than you, sometimes a lot younger than you. Um, and so you're running the race, and, and you realize, I'm not in that great of shape. And your legs begin to get tired and heavy. Uh, your lungs begin to burn a little bit. You're ready for some more oxygen. You're, you're ready to walk a little bit. But at the end of the race, for most folks, you try to push yourself as hard as you can to finish and to finish well. You try to push yourself and run hard, right, and to do whatever you can to accomplish the goal of finishing the bridge race. Here in 1 John chapter 5, we're almost at the very end of his letter, and John is doing the same thing that bridge runners did a week ago, which is do everything you can to finish this letter and to get your point across. He's trying to do everything he can to get his point across to young Christians living in Ephesus at the end of the first century. So if you remember, we've already talked a little bit about this in the previous four chapters. John wrote to these Christians living in Ephesus about the doctrinal test of what Christians should believe. And he said, you've got to follow the word of God. You've got to believe true statements about Jesus Christ. 
Secondly, he gave him the social test, which is you have to love and serve others if you're a Christian. You have to believe the right things, but you have to serve others the rest of the week. And then thirdly, he gave them the moral test. You have to follow the word of God. You have to follow what scripture teaches. You can't just disregard it and say, well, that doesn't apply to us anymore. You have to follow what scripture teaches. It's God's word for us. And so as John finishes up his letter, the race is almost over. The letter is almost over. He's doing everything he can to communicate truth to believers in the early church in Ephesus who are hearing false teachings about who Jesus was and is and what it means to follow him. And he's trying to encourage them in truth to make sure they get his point before he finishes his letter. In the five verses that we just read, John does three things. He talks about birth, spiritual birth. Then he talks about belief, faith, what it means to believe in Christ. And then thirdly, burden, the burden of following the law or the the lack of burden for those following Jesus Christ. So spiritual birth, those born of the Spirit of God is the first thing. Second thing is belief, the importance of believing in the crucified and risen Son of God. And then thirdly, the burden of either living for the world or the, the lack of burden if you're living for Jesus Christ. So those are the three things we'll look at this morning uh, from our text. So first, let's look at what John says about birth, about being born of God. Look at verse 1. John says in verse 1, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. So John says this. He says, those who believe, if you're believing now on Sunday morning at Shem Creek Press, if you believe now, that's a present tense, if you are believing, then you have been born again. Past tense. Actually, in the Greek, it's a perfect tense. It has been accomplished. You have been spiritually born of God. So if you're believing, if you are believing, putting your faith in Jesus Christ, it's because something has already happened to you. You were already born again, and therefore now you believe. There was a new birth spiritually, and now you believe. It was a spiritual birth that is one today. And here's what John's saying. You didn't do it. God did it. You're born again because God did that in your life. God gave you spiritual life when you were spiritually dead. God is completely sovereign over your spiritual life, over your birth in Jesus Christ. God chose to give you, in the words of the Old Testament, a heart of flesh, a heart that's alive. That's what flesh means, rather than a heart of stone. A stone is dead. It's cold. The Holy Spirit did that for you. And because of that, you can believe. So God chose to give you a heart of flesh. And the word born of God in verse 1, like I said, it's a perfect tense. It has been accomplished. And some of your versions may say is born of God, but it really should read has been. You already have been born of God. You already have been born spiritually. And interestingly, it's also a passive verb. Not to get too much grammar. This is the last grammar part, I promise. (laughs) Meaning you receive it. It's passive. You're not doing the action. You're not getting born again doing it. You are receiving it. It's God's work. He chose to do it, which should humble us and make us worship and be thankful that God did that. So if you're believing in Jesus Christ, it's because God gave you new life. You're born again. He gave you spiritual birth. And he did it not because he thought, you're going to be a great person when I do this. He didn't do it because he thought, well, they'll pay me back. Especially those Presbyterians, they're good about paying people back and not receiving things. He didn't do it because he thought, you know, you're better than the person down the street, so I'm going to give you new life. He didn't do that for any of those reasons. He did it because he sovereignly chose to be gracious and merciful when you didn't deserve it, when I didn't deserve it. He did it because he's gracious to us. And so our worship on Sunday morning, this morning and every Sunday morning, is a response to what God has already done. It's a response to what he's already done for us. His work of Provenient grace or initiating grace, grace that he did before you even knew he would do that for you. And so John, the writer here, he's already described a lot about this already in the New Testament. If you remember back um, in John chapter 3, remember John wrote a gospel. That was probably his first writing. And you remember the story from John chapter 3. A guy by the name of Nicodemus came to, to meet him. And Nicodemus, if you remember, was an educated probably a wealthy, well-connected man in around Jerusalem. If he lived today in 2016 in our area, he would know all the restaurants to go to in Charleston. He would be well-connected in low country living. He would know all the right people. Know all the... He was one of those kind of guys. Went to the right schools and all that. 
And Nicodemus came to Jesus Christ one night, because he really didn't want to go during the day. And he asked Jesus some questions about who he was and what it meant to, to follow him. And remember what Christ said to him. He said, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. Jesus said, Nick, can I call you Nick? Unless you're born again, Nick, you can't see the kingdom of God. It's that simple. And Nick gets confused. He doesn't know what Christ is talking about. And Jesus says to him, if you remember from John chapter 3, he says, The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit of God. And Christ's point is this, that if you've been born of the Spirit of God, it's the Spirit's work, it's God's work to bring you into the kingdom of God. It's not our work, it's God's work. We give Him the glory for it. We don't take credit for something that God has done. We don't take credit for being children of God. It's not something that we can have a bumper sticker on the back of our car or, or take any kind of credit or praise for it. It's God's work. He deserves the credit. He deserves the praise. God deserves the glory for it in our lives. He's the one who has given us a, a heart of flesh, a heart that's alive. And because of that, we believe. We have faith in Jesus Christ. And that's the second point here in these verses. John says, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. So those who have been born again are now demonstrating belief. Whether it was in Ephesus in the first century or today in Mount Pleasant in Charleston, you're demonstrating your belief. And here we see just a brief allusion to maybe some of the problems that John's addressing 2,000 years ago in the early church in Ephesus. It appears that some of the people around Ephesus, some of the false teachers, were teaching false views of Christ and denying that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, denying that Jesus is the true, eternal, anointed Son of God. They were denying that He had come in the flesh and become one of us, which is the miracle we celebrate at Christmas, that God took on human flesh. They were saying, eh, that's not really what the Bible teaches. And John's trying to counter that. He's trying to push back and say, no, this is what the Word of God says. John says you have to have faith, but more importantly, your faith must be in Jesus Christ, the Son of God the only one who came to die for your sins on the cross. And John says, true Christians give evidence that they are God's children by their faith, by what they believe. And so faith or belief is evidence that God's done a work in your life already. Belief is a sign that God's already given you new life, that that's been accomplished, that you have that this morning. It's a consequence of your new birth. And so the question this morning to think about it as we go through these verses is, are you placing your faith in Jesus Christ? Or are you placing your faith in someone else or something else this morning? If you aren't trusting in Christ, it's evidence that maybe you have not been born again. It means you're living with God not as your father, but rather as your judge. A just judge who will do what's right and punish his sin. It means that scripture calls you to repentance. calls you to give your life to Jesus Christ. On the other hand, this morning, if you're putting your faith and believing in Jesus Christ, it's evidence that you belong to God's family. It's evidence that God is your Father, that Jesus Christ is your Redeemer and your brother, and the Holy Spirit is now with you as your Comforter, as your Counselor, as Christ promised. I think too often today, we talk, when we talk about faith in America today, faith usually often becomes about us, our experience of faith, how we feel about Jesus Christ. And we see that you know Sunday morning worship experiences in a lot of churches. And, and too much that focus becomes inward. We talk about faith. It becomes about what we experience. And that's not what John's talking about. Faith is not about how much we can stir up in ourselves on a Sunday morning, how much faith we can feel, or how positive we can feel about God's plan for our life. Rather, what's important is the object of your faith, which has to be Jesus Christ. It's not about our experience of faith as much as it is the object of our faith, the one who's died on the cross for us. About 250 years ago, Jonathan Edwards gave a wonderful Christ-centered definition of faith. That's a good reminder for us. Edwards wrote, Faith is the soul's hearty conviction and acknowledgement of God's power in difficult things, His mercy in wonderful things, His truth in in mysterious things, and the excellency of salvation in Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. This is what faith is. Faith is the soul's conviction and acknowledgement of God's 
power in difficult things, his mercy in wonderful things, his truth in mysterious things, and the excellency of Jesus Christ in your salvation. The triune God calls you and I to be people of faith here in Mount Pleasant, here in Charleston, to demonstrate our conviction of God's power in difficult things and the pain, the challenges of life that we all go through, to demonstrate our acknowledgement of his mercy in the wonderful things that happen to us that we celebrate that are out of our control, and to demonstrate that we trust his truth in the things that are mysterious, the things that are beyond us that we don't understand. And then finally, to demonstrate our salvation is only in Jesus Christ, And I think the people of Mount Pleasant and Charleston need to see that in us. The people of Mount Pleasant do not need to see more people pretending to be Christians. The folks of Mount Pleasant don't need to see people who are Christians on Sunday morning when they put on maybe a jacket and a tie and go somewhere and then leave. That's not what they need to see. They don't need to see people who are pretending to be Christians but still living for the idols of the culture, living for things, success, personal advancement, materialism. They don't need to see people claiming Christianity then living for the same set of idols that everyone else lives for. The, your coworkers, your neighbors, your friends, your relatives, they need to see you demonstrate what Edward said, a strong conviction in God, in the difficult things, his mercy in the wonderful things, his truth in the mysterious things. They need to see that in us, and that's the belief that God calls us to. So John's talked about birth, he's talked about belief as evidence of that new birth, and then thirdly, he talks about burdens. That's his third point here. Children of God are to love the commands of God and love the people of God. That's what John says. To love God, love his commands, and love his people. Does that seem like a burden to you this morning? Sometimes it does seem like a burden. Do God's commands for your life his will for you, do they seem like a weight that you have to bear because you don't really want to do it? Does demonstrating service for others, loving your neighbors yourself, does that seem like a burden you can't bear sometimes, like it's too much for you to do? In the first century, when John's writing, the Pharisees had added hundreds of things for the people to do if they were people of faith, if they were religious. Do this, and they had hundreds of things you had to do to follow. But John says, if you look at verse 3 with me, John says this, This is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. John writes that those who are born again, those who believe, should follow God's commands, and it's not a burden. It's not a weight. God's commands might be a burden for you. They might be a weight if you're not living for Jesus Christ. If you believe that possessions or money or stuff or things will bring you satisfaction, then trying to do that and also trying to honor God, it's too much for you to do. You'll just be crushed under the weight of it. If God's not the ultimate priority in your life, the triune God is not a priority, then putting him first seems like it's too much. Because I'm trying to do this and God wants me to do this. And that's very simple. We talk about this a lot. That's because your heart could be set on an idol. You're looking for meaning and ultimately meaningless things. You're looking for success, looking for more stuff, more things, more personal advancement that will never bring you the joy you think it will. There's always more to do. God's commands are burdens if he's not a priority, if his glory is not central in your life. If God's there to meet a five-year plan for you, if he's there just to help you become the best person you can be, then he's not your God. He's really just a means to selfish ends. He's not your God. And we know the first commandment, no other gods before me. We talked about that this morning. But if you know you're born again, born from the Holy Spirit and have belief in God, and you know that it's a gift from God, John says it's evidence of your salvation. If you know that, if you're believing that, then following the words of your Heavenly Father will not be a burden. It's not a burden because you know He has your best interest in mind. He has secured your salvation. He's secured peace with God, the Father. He's done that on the cross for you. And so you know he has your best interests in mind. You know he is your God. He is your redeemer. And so you can live for him. And what he asks you to do is not too much because he's given you everything you have this morning. Jesus Christ said in Matthew 11, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest 
for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In a chaotic, stressful world, there is spiritual rest in Jesus Christ. If we are living for him and have given him our lives, we give him control and follow him. And we know our eternal future is secure. He's already purchased it at the cross. We know that Christ has us in his hands. He loves us. He's going to do what's best for us, even if we don't understand it sometimes. Life is difficult. There are things we struggle with. And he will lead us and guide us through, as the psalmist says, the valley of the shadow of death. But he's there with you. And will lead you into eternal life. And that's why John says in verses 4 and 5 this morning that we have overcome the world. He says it three times. He says, children of God have overcome the world. He says it's already accomplished. It's already become a fact that we have overcome the world. He says it three times in those verses. That word means a conqueror. It means you're victorious. And so the question this morning is, what what are we conquered? What are we victorious over? What is John referring to? I think it includes several things. It includes in the first century what they're dealing with, persecution from the Roman government in the first century. This was a daring claim for, for John to make, that you have overcome the world when Caesar is on the throne in Rome, dictating your life and can take your life if you don't pledge allegiance to him. This is a daring claim for John to make to say, you guys are victors, you're conquerors. It doesn't matter if you're poor, it doesn't mean if you're an average citizen in the empire, you're, you're victorious, not because of yourself, but because of Jesus Christ. So it's victorious over that. It's also over moral pressures, the challenge to give in to the culture. They had that in the first century. We have that in the 21st century to compromise Scripture and give in to what Scripture doesn't say and say, oh, we just need to give in. This is what's popular today. Thirdly, it includes false teaching, what we just call heresy, false teaching about Jesus Christ. That was a problem 2,000 years ago. That's why John writes. It's a problem today when when so many Christian leaders just give pep talks and self-help talks, don't preach from Scripture, tell people what they want to hear. That's false teaching. And so we need to claim biblical truth over that. And finally, it includes personal struggles. John says you're victorious over those, the things that we struggle in life, the pain of life, the addictions in our lives, the sin that traps us, that floods us with guilt and shame. He says we're victorious over that, not because we can muster up faith, but because Christ has died on the cross and secured your position forever. He secured your eternal life. And so John writes this, that you're victorious, you're conquerors, to ordinary people in the Roman Empire. And he writes it for ordinary people in Mount Pleasant and in Charleston today. He's not writing this and thinking about heroes of the faith. He's not thinking of Elijah or Moses. He's writing to ordinary people who need to hear this truth. He's writing to us this morning. If you remember, this is the same John who, before he dies, will write the book of Revelation. And usually when we think of Revelation, what comes to your mind? All the apocalyptic imagery, right? Right? All those things, the beast rising out of the sea, the red dragon, you know, in Revelation, a beast with ten horns and seven heads, right? Trumpets blowing earthquakes, cosmic destruction, not sure what's happening half the time in Revelation. That's what we think of in the book of Revelation. But remember, Revelation was a letter written to seven churches. And John tells the members of those seven churches, people in Ephesus and Philadelphia and Smyrna, he says, be faithful and become overcomers, become victorious conquerors because of the victory in Christ. He says that to each church that he writes the letter to in the first three chapters of Revelation, that they are victors, they are conquerors because of Christ. Not because they're great people, but because they've given their life to a great God. And so because of the work of Christ at the cross, members of the church in the first century in Ephesus and church members today in Mount Pleasant and Charleston have the hope of eternal life. We have peace with God because of what Christ has done for us. So John here is near the end of his letter. And like the the, the runner last week trying to get over the bridge and do whatever it takes to finish, John's trying to do whatever he can to finish this letter and get his point across, to communicate truth to these people. Last Saturday in the bridge race, there was a, a man named Adam Gorlitsky who completed the bridge race. I don't know how many of you read about his story in the paper this past week, but um, he is the first paralyzed man to walk the Cooper River Bridge Run. And he walked it at 0.8 miles per hour. He's 29 years old. He graduated from Wando High School. He's a resident here. In December of 2005, he was in a car wreck and was paralyzed. And he 
sat before a board of doctors after he was recovering, and they said, you'll never walk again. Um, this is your life now after this car wreck. But with some advancements in technology, and 10 years later, now he has this thing called the Rewalk Exoskeleton. And the doctors gave him this thing called the EMAG Control Leg Braces. And that allowed him to take 17,932 steps to get from Moultrie Middle to the finish line. 17,932 steps. It took him over five hours to do the bridge race. It took him so long that the official finish line on Meeting Street had already been taken up, and he had to go to basically a temporary one they put up for him by the aquarium because they had to open the roads up. When he got to this temporary finish line by the aquarium, he was exhausted, as you might imagine. Um, he was dehydrated, getting some water, and he had a crowd of maybe 100 people there to welcome him and to celebrate with this young man this accomplishment of walking for five hours uh, to cross the bridge race. He said this, this, I think it was in the paper, he said, this was the greatest moment of my life. This is the beginning of the rest of my life. Adam Gorlitsky finished the bridge race, and it was an amazing story. That many steps, and it's an encouraging story for us to read. It's about a paralyzed man who was given the ability to walk 6.2 miles last Saturday. And he was able to walk because someone else gave him the braces. Someone else gave him that rewalk exoskeleton that he wears. Someone else came to him and did something to him that allowed him to walk the bridge race. That's the picture that John's painting for us this morning. If you believe in our living and following Christ, living by faith and following him, it's because someone, the triune God, did something for you that you couldn't do for yourself. The Holy Spirit gave you spiritual life, gave you that gift of eternal life. The Holy Spirit did a miracle in your life that you couldn't do for yourself. You can't be good enough. You can't do enough things. And the Holy Spirit did that for you. And because of that, you're able to respond with spiritual walking. and Walking with the Lord, as we say. And that God calls you to live in response to the miracle of your salvation. To share the gospel with others in the community. To tell others that God did a work for you that you couldn't do for yourself and redeemed you. He gave you spiritual legs, so to speak, when you couldn't walk. And he gave you spiritual life when you were dead. God calls you to live in response to that and share that this week with those that God puts in your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you that you called us to put our faith in you, to put our trust in you. And we thank you for your Holy Spirit who gives us that gift of, of new life, a spiritual life, and that gives us the ability to believe, to respond to you. And that because of that, your commands are not burdensome to live for you. And so we thank you for that, Lord. We pray that your Holy Spirit would use the, the bread and the juice to strengthen our faith, to help us. Our faith needs to be encouraged. We need to be reminded of the promises of the gospel. And so we pray that your Holy Spirit would work now uh, through these elements. In Christ's name. Amen.